Leon Garcia. Yes. Lovely to see you. Thank, Thank you. you very much Same for joining here. me today. Sure. Um, how on earth do you become a WWE ring announcer? Like, you're not well, Howard Finkel's daughter or anything, are you? No, I'm no, not. Okay. <laughs> no, and I, I don't think I even came in the traditional route at all. As a matter of fact, I think I was the first to come in from the non-wrestling associations okay. of any sort, of any kind of uh, NXT or anything like that that didn't even exist uh, back in 1999. But I was actually living in New York City, and I was doing a lot of work, um, voiceovers and hosting, and I had an agent, and my agent called me and said the WWF at the time, yeah. <laughs> that they wanted to, um, they were holding rounds of auditions, and we didn't even know what it was for at first, but I went, wait a minute, wrestling? I mean, I used to watch it as a kid with my dad, but <laughs> what in the world, because I'm not a wrestler, like what in the world is this all about? And he goes, I don't really know, but I would just go to the audition anyway. So I made my way up to Stanford, and I auditioned, I remember it was Michael Cole running uh, the audition with me and asking me some questions, and I'm asking him some questions like a backstage interviewer kind of deal. Mm. And nothing had been said yet about ring announcing. Right. And, um, and then I did some other like impromptu kind of things that they wanted to see if I could sell on the spot, that kind of deal. And then they called me back for a callback and um, they were starting a show called SmackDown. And that's when everything in the callback, um, I didn't even know yet. I just knew that every time I went in there, I was like, okay, if this is meant to be, just let me do my best and we'll go from there. Yeah. And then they called me and said, we'd like to try you out for two to three months and um, see how it goes. And I'm like, well, I've got nothing to lose. So I showed up at Iowa State University and that was August 23rd of 1999. And that was the day when Michael Cole showed me around backstage at 3.30 that afternoon, I found out, oh yeah, by the way, you're going to announce uh, Raw tonight. I'm like, what? Uh, hey. <laughs> um, really? And how exactly do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and so Tony Chimmel sat with me and kind of gave me the rundown as to what to say for each match. So I was writing and scrabbling notes, you know, yeah. like crazy. And um, I remember we were going live an hour earlier because we were in central time. So we were actually going live at 8. Okay. So at 6.45, he came to get me. Now, he sat with me at 5.30 that night. And I had like a half hour to get dressed. At 6.45, he comes out to get me to sit at ringside to watch him do Sunday Night Heat, which was a show that we had before Raw yeah. at the time. So I'm watching him as I'm rewriting my notes because I can't even read my scribble from before. Everything got so fast. <laughs> And that's Mark Ayton looked at me and he goes, you know, you can't use cue cards, right? And this is 20 minutes before we're going to go live. Oh, and I looked at him and I was like, please, right now is not a good time for a joke. <laughs> like, you can't even handle this right now. And he's like, no, I'm not joking, really. Kevin Dunn, the producer and the executive, he does not like to, to see cue cards. Like, oh my gosh. I mean, I felt that rush of just, I wanted to run. Yeah, you yeah. know, I just felt sick to my stomach and I just like, ah, I can't do this. Something came over me though, and I feel like I remember being thrown into the pool at nine years old, not knowing how to swim, and saying, You're going to be in the swim team now, and here you go. And it was like a sink or swim. Yeah. And it was like I had a flashback to that moment, and here it was, and it was sink or swim. And uh, I guess I floated okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say, and, <laughs> three month trial, and you're still here. Yeah, Hasn't exactly. Gone too badly, has it? Right? Wow. And so. When you first went up to Stanford, when you didn't know what the, what the audition was for, right? Were you prepared to possibly get in the ring? Did you think that no, maybe they I, were going to? No, I knew it wasn't wrestling, but okay. they didn't know exactly what. They okay. just assured me it wasn't wrestling. Right. Okay. So I'm like, okay, because I don't know that I could pull that off yeah. <laughs> with no training. But then I pulled this off with no training. It was kind of crazy. And have you ever had an inkling to get in the ring? You know, so many people have asked me that. Yeah. And the thing is, is I actually have watched over the years the training that it takes to mm. get in there. And I feel like it's not fair for me if I'm not going to go 100% to want to be a, a diva and learn everything, to learn a couple moves, go into the ring and call myself a wrestler, to me I feel like it's disrespectful to the business yeah. and not respectful to all the hours that are put in to actually be that. I mean, I'm the kind of person, if I'm going to decide to do something, I put wholeheartedly in there. And I, I learned being involved and being able to sing on the show, I quickly was like, okay, I know what my purpose here is, is hosting, doing backstage interviews at the time when I was doing them first yeah. SmackDown at the time, and then singing. And that's my role here. 
and it's been awesome. I think that I, I haven't felt like I'm missing something because I haven't been wrestling. Yeah. So singing, obviously, is something that you have put everything into. Yes. Um, what music did you like growing up? I, I've listened to everything growing up. I mean, really? my parents played everything <laughs> from rock to classical and opera. And then you had, I, I mean, it was just and Spanish music because I grew up in Spain. Oh, okay. So I just had a little bit of influence of, of every type of music, which I love because mm. Um, that's what's made it a lot of fun and when I started singing at 14 is when I joined my first band my mom would chaperone me in the clubs and I was playing with a with a band there and we had to sing everything from beach music because I lived in South Carolina country to pop and it was cool because I got to experience every gamut of it and decide what it was that I actually like to do the most and so then how did you kind of make that leap and, and sort of become a singing star well, that was actually The Rock. I mean, we finally, you know, we did so many backstage interviews yeah. that we formed a friendship. And he loves to sing, as you know, he'll bring yeah, out his guitar. So have seen his Instagram? He's right? always playing guitar right? and singing. So when he found out that I sang, it was like, oh, you got to sing me something, you this. And then um, found out that they do the national anthem at the live events over the weekend. They always play the national anthem. And I told him, I was like, you know, I actually sang the national anthem at my graduation. And he's like, you did? I gotta let them know that. So he told Jack Lanza, the agent at the time, he's like, you know, we should have her open up the show with a national anthem instead of actually playing the national yeah. anthem, you know, a recording of it. So I did it in Denver, and that was, um, boy, that was February 12th, and, or I think it was the 11th on Friday. And I did it that night, and I did it Saturday night, I did it Sunday night because I was doing the live events mm. that weekend. And then by Monday, Pat Patterson and Jack and all of them went to Vince. They were like, oh, she's incredible. You gotta, you gotta see her. And he's like, I, I gotta see what this is all about. So it was February 14th, Valentine's Day in San oh, Jose amazing. that I actually sang for the first time to, and it was not televised yet. It was right just for the house, right yeah. before Raw aired and he loved it so much that he had me do it at every event and That's then amazing. I ended up doing it at three WrestleManias and hold the record for that wow. <laughs> which has been awesome. So you got a lot to thank The Rock for. I do, I do, it was great. I mean like I said we, we had some amazing interviews and, and time together and all so it was great that he saw that and, and you know it's like they say networking, who yeah. knows who and him mentioning it and allowed me and opened a door for me to do it here which was great. And are you still in touch with The Rock? Is he quite hard to get hold of now? He's quite hard to get hold of now. I, you know, we talk from time to time, and when I see him backstage or something, for sure, it's like nothing. No time has passed, and I'm so, um, you know, I, I'm just so happy for his success and what he's what he's done in the business. Yeah. Um, now, so you mentioned the the national anthem. Singing it has become a, a huge part of kind of what you're known for in the in the WWE. What's been the most special occasion that you've sung it? I have a feeling I know what you're going to say. But, there's well, actually two. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's actually two. Definitely right after 9-11. Yeah. I mean, that was, uh, wow. I mean, that's the moment that the national anthem means the most, you know? Um, I've just got goosebumps thinking of that moment <laughs> you sang it. How weird. Yeah. yeah, it's funny because, and my eyes are tearing up. Like, yeah. when I think of that moment and I think of everything that I was going through and I remember I had to hold, hold it together and I kept saying, gosh, I really hope I can pull this off and it's a cappella and it's just me with me and you can hear my voices shaking from just the emotion and then the fans with all their signs and everybody needed that moment mm -hmm. you know to come together and Vince remembered I remember him telling me you know I really want you to do this and we, we need you to pull us together and no, like, no pressure <laughs> you know but I was going through so much because I lived in New York City at the time and so I was a, a mess for two days you mm. know longer really but I mean leading up to that moment so I just said every everything that the song says I just listened to every word and expressed it how I was feeling and how um, I could best convey it and try to make that moment mean something mm. and I think it did and um, it was a magical moment just because of everything that was going on. I forgot it was a cappella as well. Yeah, it was a cappella. No track to. Right, oh, wow. right. So the other moment was fast forward. Here we are in Iraq and Afghanistan, and now I'm performing it in front of all the soldiers that are fighting mm. for our freedom and for everything that happened. And 
my gosh, I mean, being surrounded like in the ring with all these soldiers and here's, you know, Saddam Hussein's palace is in the background and I'll, I'm just like, wow, I mean, these guys are living this. And I'll never forget after I got done singing it, one of the soldiers came to me, he's like, thank you. Thank you for singing it because we never hear that song here. I'm like, you never hear that Oh, wow. Yeah, Why would you, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was like, wow, I never even realized it because it's not like they play it every morning or anything like that because, but it really reassures us and, and reminds us why we're here and why we give up our lives and our time and all that. And I was like, and as an army brat, I mean, my dad is a retired lieutenant colonel. Okay. I was born in the military base. Mm. Like I was born with soldiers all around me and that was natural to me. So anytime that I'm in that environment with soldiers, I feel like I'm home. Yeah. So it was uh, pretty powerful growing up. I grew up in Madrid, Spain. My dad was working for the American Embassy there. And I went to school, Royal Oaks is on the base. And that's okay. how I learned how, how to speak English and all. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, a, it's a tie that I really do have and a bond that I have with our soldiers and our military men and how women. How special then to be able to yeah. have those moments. Exactly. Um, so on to the slightly brighter things. Yes. WWE has a huge connection with music through, I mean, you know, they have live performances from bands, entrance themes are a big thing. Mm -hmm. Even their video packages, you know, I've always said the, like the production values on WWE are just, you oh, know, they're amazing. Hollywood in their execution. Even they're better. <laughs> yeah, even better, really. Even better. So uh, with that music connection with WWE, would you ever team with the, the or have you ever connected with the music team and worked on an entrance theme? Would, would you ever sing an entrance theme for a superstar? I actually did. You I actually sang did. Tori Wilson's entrance theme song. Okay. Need a little time. Okay. <laughs> that was the name of it, yeah. And it's funny because I just saw her a couple of days ago. I just uh, had a little, little slumber party with her and Candice Michelle. <laughs> so it was cool to oh, nice. get back together again. But yeah, no, I love doing entrance themes. And w I actually want to tell them, hey, uh, if you want to do more, I was going to say, is, is that fun. something you'd pitch for to, uh, do, to do more? I haven't since then, but you just reminded me to let yeah. them know again, so thanks. Oh, <laughs> yeah, they're fun to do, for sure. Yeah. Um, now going back to announcing, em any memorable mistakes that you can remember? Oh my God. Because your mind has so to just many. go blank every now and again, <laughs> surely. So many, especially when you're not trained to do the job and you're learning on the job. Yeah. And that was the thing, as I was learning on the job and not being able to use a cue card. So it was tough because I had watched as a kid, but then when I went to high school and middle school, I mean, high school and college, I didn't watch the product anymore because I was mm. just so into to, you know school. But so all of a sudden, when I came up to announce, I really didn't know who the new, I mean, superstars changed yeah, so course, much. Yeah, yeah. And so I was like, I knew Ric Flair, I knew Andre Giant, and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I don't know some of these people. And so it was really tough, and sometimes I'd call them by the wrong name. I'm like, oh my God. I'll never forget, like one of them was having a match, there was two Chris's, one of them's having a match, and one of them's coming up. And so I'm like studying who's coming up, who's coming up, which was Jericho. Jericho okay. was coming up, so I'm like, Jericho, Jericho, you know, studying it. Now, ding, 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 this match ends, here's your winner, and I said Chris Jericho. And Chris Jericho wasn't even in the <laughs> ring, he was there. coming up next. Amazing. So, I mean, things happen all the time. I mean, even the other night, I, I mentioned, um, it was a Nikki Bella was coming out, and all of a sudden, what comes out of me, instead of saying she's the Divas Champion, I say she's the WWE Women's Champion. So, oh, okay. it's like old school came right into yeah. my head. Like, those things that happen that you go, what? I didn't even know I did it. That's what the oh, crazy really? thing is. I didn't okay. even know I did it. I sat down after the show. I'm looking through my Twitter feed, and people say, are like, social media "Women's you know. champion, women." <laughs> I'm like, "Did I say women's champion? I, I had no clue." So yeah. it's just one of those things. You're, you're just in the show. You're this or that, and then you say these things, and they're just so natural because I used to say it for so many years. And would you ever get in trouble for a mistake like that? Or did they didn't say anything. No. no, I think it's live TV. Yeah. There's so many people that stumble. The thing about ring announcing though, it's different with commentators. If they say something, they're like, excuse me. And then they, you know, correct it. I can't do that. <laughs> I even said, I remember saying, here's, you know, here's your winner or, um, yeah, here are your winners, and the, and I was supposed to say, and the new, and what comes out of me, and the still, new, <laughs> and I just quickly corrected it, but I couldn't say, and the still, excuse me, new, yeah, yeah. you can't do it. It's, it's the same thing. Spoils the moment, wouldn't it? You can't, you yeah. can't do that. So 
it's a little harder being an announcer and not even notice even newscasters do it all the time they'll say something they'll go oh excuse me and then they'll correct themselves and it sounds a little natural but we're not able to do that so it sticks out like a <laughs> sore thumb <laughs> but hey it's you well, know hi. 14 years in the business here's what my my way of thinking of this is not every basketball player is going to make every free throw and every shot and everything but exactly. if there are percentages or high, that's what makes him a great basketball player, right? Yeah. It's like, I have mistakes, but I, most for th 14 years, I haven't. So my percentage is high and I do my best. You're doing pretty well. I do my best, <laughs> you know, and I'm do, human. <laughs> you, exactly, and do you feel a lot of pressure and, and do you still find it really exciting if, like, cause I love it when there's a big title match coming up, say it's, I don't know, Cena, Brock Lesnar, and you've got both competitors in the ring, yes. you do the announcements when they're there, yes. when the crowd's hot, oh, big, it's big fight feel, that's right. got to feel amazing. It's, it's incredible. It's a, whenever I see championship ring announcements, I'm like, yes, there's so much fun to yeah. do. I mean, it is, your heart's just like, you know, because yeah. it's, it's you, it's acapella. Yeah. You know what I mean? It is. It's a cappella. So it's your heart's just racing, but at the same time, your adrenaline is just so high and it's just so much fun to do. So, Lillian, you must have been at ringside for, I mean, literally thousands of matches. Yes. Thousands. Any, any memorable ones that stick out? Every What's your time I get asked that, I'm like, how can you ask yeah. me to choose one? <laughs> Seriously, it's one of those things that every, every one of them, I feel like, are so special in their own way for whatever reason. I mean, of course, when you've got TLC matches or something like that, it's, um, it's gonna be, they're gonna stand out more than a regular match yeah. because they're so, also so much more dangerous in a way. Uh, it's just it's some of the things that you see are a hell in the cell or a steel cage match or you know, any, anything like that, elimination chamber, this massive chamber staring at you those are gonna stand out because of that. But then you also have some of your amazing matches that have none of that, that just the way that they flow, that you're like, whoa, that timing, that this, that that yeah. is just amazing. It's like, it's like this art that's been put together and just everything connects and everything flows and it's just, you're like, wow, that's one of the best matches I've ever seen. But what's great about this business is that you keep saying that. Yeah. And the more, oh, that's one of the, no, maybe that's one of yeah. the best matches. That, oh, no, I think that's the one. You know, that's why it's so hard for me to pick one because they just keep getting better and better and better. It's amazing. It's full of pretty special moments, isn't it? Yeah. The I always say that the superstars and the divas, they are the most athletic in our world. And yeah. I, I don't even say that as a, because I work here, you know. I really mean it. I mean, yeah. they're in the ring 300 plus states a year. There is no other sport out there that, is on the road and doing what they do night after night after night after night and putting on a show and people think oh maybe wrestling's fake i'm like if you see ice pack here ice yeah. pack there i mean the can't hardly walk you know after they're 40 or 50 it's it's crazy and that's why i have so much respect for the superstars and the divas and what they put themselves through and it does feel to me like you are a fan because so often in the back of shot you can see you and your reactions at oh, ringside. Yeah. You know, if something big happens, you're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it must be pretty amazing to be so close to the action every night. Oh, it definitely is. And I'm, I'm definitely a fan. Like I said, I used to watch with my dad. Like, it was one of those special things that dad and I would be yelling at the TV and screaming. And it's funny, I have a sister, and um, my sister just didn't want anything to do with it. Mm. She was more into watching movies with mom, and dad and I were the ones that were at the TV, and that was our thing. And yeah. he, I'll never forget when he surprised me with tickets to go to the Township Auditorium in Columbia, South Carolina, and I got to see Andre the Giant. Amazing. I was, oh, I, I, I tell you, I remember it like, like it was yesterday. It was just so impactful of that moment. So when I see kids at the show and I see their faces, I can relate. I'm like, oh, I was there, dad brought me, you know, cheering on. And, and so I, I am a fan and that's why I've been in this industry and, and came back. You know, I left after 10 years and after two years being away from it, I was like, wow, I really do miss it. And when I got the call, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. You know, let's, let's I want to do it again. And so we, you were concentrating on your music in that two years that you had a break from WWE? Well, you know, I'd also, I'd been traveling for 10 years and as you know, we don't, take a break or yeah. anything. It's every every year, I mean, every week we're on the road. And I had just, um, I was just about to get married. 
and I was also moving from New York to California and there was just a lot of things that I was like, you know, I think I need a break right now yeah. and I really did think though that it was going to be like, okay, time for a new chapter and I moved and I got married and it was great because I had that time to settle in and, and start a marriage without being on the road all the time yeah, and all which was yeah. important. But after two years, it was, I mean, I started, I went to the SummerSlam party and I remember I was invited in August, right before I came back, I was invited and they looked at me and they're like, you ready to come back? But at the time I wasn't ready yet. And then all around November, it's when everything was like, wow, I really miss this. Like you, it's, it's really one of those things, it's, it's a family. You, you step away from it for a while and then you're like, wow. And that's why I feel like there's been so many that have retired and then they come back. Yeah. It just it's it's when it's in your blood, it's in your blood, and it's in my blood. Yeah, I truly believe that. I think that yeah. once it hooks you, you yeah. kind of, you're there. Yeah, <laughs> and what's great about the WWE, they've been really supportive about my music career, and they see that I can do both, and they've been very, like I said, very supportive and promoting my music and all, which is something I'm always going to do because that's just that's in my blood as well. Yeah. And so has your your career in WWE really helped the music side of things, like help promoting your band and everything? Well, I don't think it ever hurts. No. I don't know that it's, I don't know. i be honest with you, I don't know what it would have been without, so I can't compare yeah. it, but I, I always say, I'm sure it didn't hurt, it hasn't hurt. And it's, it's fun. Uh, I've got a, a new song coming out, it's called Stung. And it's funny because I actually saw some, um, the other day I saw some uh, posters and somebody was holding on, it said stung. And I was like, stung, what? And now I realize they've been stung because Sting. Because they're a Sting fan, uh, they've been yeah. stung. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my. And then I went, wow, what is the chances of that? That might, you know, my next single is called Stung. And I just had a, a single that came out before that was called Warrior. And that was right after Mania and, you know, all that. I was like, God, it just seems like it just keeps chasing the. The songs keep chasing my life here. Well, you see, I've got a theory. I think WWE brought back Warrior and Sting just to help promote those records. Oh, there That's you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, here we are, backstage at Raw. Yes. Um, what does a sort of TV day entail for you from a kind of production standpoint? Well, um, it changes from week to week. Yeah. Um, today, for example, you know, I got here, I mean, it's always like, Drop the bags, go get lunch. We have the best <laughs> catering in the world. <laughs> they really are great quick caterers, so we always uh, we're excited about going to lunch. So we, you know, get to see everybody and all that for about an hour. You've got like that that moment of just saying, "You're about what'd you do this week?" You know, yeah. and then it's um, okay. Got to get ready. The whole nine yards of the the hair and the makeup and all that good stuff, <laughs> and just been doing voiceovers, doing this interview, going off and doing um, some. I'm not really exactly sure what it's, I know it's for the USO, which is, like I said, because I'm an army brat, that means a lot to me. Yeah. I'm not really sure what I'm doing for it, but <laughs> it's some on-camera thing that they need for that. And then getting ready for the show, like literally looking at, okay, and then especially because Raw has got so many matches and I do superstars as well, you know, leading into it. So it's what's happening in each match. Is there any special announcements and just getting that ingrained. Yeah. And Raw going to three hours, has that made a big sort of impact on you? Well, it's personally? more announcing, that's yeah. for sure, more <laughs> matches. Yeah. And it's also a fact of, nobody thinks about this, but at ringside, I can't really drink water on Mondays because I can't of leave course, ringside. Yeah. So I'm out there for about four hours. And for right. a woman, <laughs> that's a little <laughs> tough. So I'm always like a little dehydrated on yeah. Mondays. By the time you get to the main event, you're it's a bit like, croaky. Oh, there are times that I'm just like telling my assistant, can you please, can you please go to the restroom for me, please? <laughs> he laughs and I went, God, if there was an app for that, <laughs> that would somebody awesome. would make a lot of money, yeah. right? But that's the thing that sometimes now going to the three hours and then you got superstars on top and then yeah. you've got the post-match also that we do just for the house, for yeah. the, the live show. So you've got about four hours that you're out there. So sometimes I'm, you know, like, oh my God, sweating. <laughs> <laughs> Has your voice ever gone during an announcement? Oh yeah, I've had those moments. I, I even had, like I went on tour uh, in November and I knew there was something wrong and I went to the doctor and they were like, oh, we totally think it's, uh, what is it? I think it's viral when they won't give you the antibiotics. So they're like, oh, it's viral. We can't give you antibiotics. It's just one of those things you're just going to have to tough it out. I mean, I'm like, God, I'm going on tour. This is crazy because, you know, the first thing it does is affect your voice. Mm. And so you're going on tour and you're announcing 
it's anywhere between 10 to 14 shows or something, and it's constant every single night. Yeah. And I remember it was pretty rough on tour. There were some times that it was like, wow, I sounded pretty husky. <laughs> you know. And then I found out I actually had pneumonia the entire time. So I had walking pneumonia Seriously? that I was announcing with. Was this the UK tour? This November? was just now in November. Uh, we, uh, let's see, the first half, I did the second half. Right. The first half, thank God I wasn't scheduled in the first half because I was actually in bed the entire week. Oh, wow. I mean, I was so sick. And then I started feeling better and I went ahead and pushed through and went to, I think we was London that we did the show. And then from there went on to, I think it was Germany or France. I know we, I did Spain, uh, Madrid, where I'm from. Cause I, I was singing, I, I always try to do the national anthems or the song that is special to the country, yeah. wherever we're at, whether it's Australia, I'll do the Australian national anthem or Scotland, they have Flower Scotland. And in Spain, we have a song called Que Viva España, which means Long Live Spain. Okay. And so I remember going, am I going to be able to pull this through? And I literally had the, the fans like singing. There's one part that they actually <laughs> sing back. And it was just awesome. But I remember starting the song a little lower so that I could sing it. Yeah. But I pulled it off and it was a great moment. Wow. It must That's be fun. special going back to Madrid. It, yes. Yeah. It, it always very. It's between Madrid and then when we do the show in Puerto Rico, because my dad's from Puerto Rico. Okay. So I've got a lot of family in Puerto Rico. So I always call myself the Puerto Rican, uh, the the Spaniard Boricua. Lovely. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of your dad, is he okay? Yes. Uh, Good. Doing much better. He's getting um, better help. Um, new doctors. And uh, I can't really go into like everything, but uh, yeah, he's doing much better. It was quite a scare though, that's okay. for sure. That's good. Um, so we're on the road to WrestleMania. WrestleMania 31 in the Bay Area is gonna be amazing. Yes. Um, an exciting time to be a fan. Cause I mean, the thing is with WrestleMania, it's not just a one day thing by any stretch of the imagination. Right. It's a full week of activities. What are you most looking forward to about this year's uh, WrestleMania week? Everything. I mean, I it's so much fun from fan access to I'm doing media on Thursday. That is all it's for the Spanish um, all morning is for the Spanish channels and all, which is really great because then I get to speak my native tongue, actually, because yeah. I, I didn't learn English till I was five. But um, yeah, so it's fun to, to switch. And sometimes it's a little you have to think about because especially because I've, I've now spoken English longer than I have Spanish because mm. I live here. So there's times that I'm like, oh, I can't remember how to say this word in, the, in, in Spanish. But it's great because it's always it's a challenge, you know, again. And uh, so that's fun. So I've got a whole day of that. And then I'm actually doing the USO, um, doing something with, for the troops. So that's going to be great and very special. And then I'm one of the, the uh, spokespersons for Susan G. Komen. My mom's a breast cancer survivor. So I'm doing some luncheon for Susan G. Komen. So that's very special. And so it, it's, it's awesome that I get to incorporate everything that I'm passionate about into Mania Week. Yeah. And then doing the autograph signing at Fan Access because meeting the fans is, is always a blast. Yeah. And they're the reasons I have a job. So I always thank them so much because if, I, if it wasn't for their support and always cheering me on and letting you know the bosses know and all of that, yeah. that they, they like me and stuff, it's, and they keep me here, which is great. And I assume you've got a horde of male fans. What's, what's the strangest gift you've ever been given by a fan? I don't know whether it's really a gift, but there is a fan that actually had me tattooed on his leg. And when wow. I say had me tattooed on his leg, it's a whole, it's a picture of me. And then he added wings, angel wings. He's like, you're my angel. I'm like, whoa, like this is forever. I hope I never, <laughs> ever like make him mad in any way because this is forever, you know what I mean? I actually got to meet him. He was a really nice guy, very nice guy. And I was just like, this is incredible. I mean, I've touched you that much. That's a you... big thing, isn't oh, yeah. it? And it's this big. I mean, it's big. So I'm like, the pain he must have gone through too to get that. Is that a strange feeling for you, knowing that you can sort of have that impact on someone? I have realized that, you know, in this job, the celebrity, that kind of thing, it's one of the things you sign up for. You're yeah. going to have an impact because people live sometimes vicariously through your life and yeah. through you. So that's why I feel it's very, very important to always appreciate your fans and just, um, you know, take your work very seriously. And that's why I say, like, even when I make a mistake, it, it, I'm, I try to brush it off 
and I do the best I can, but it also, I, I take it hard because I am a straight A student. Like I really worked <laughs> hard, you know, and, and I like to be perfect. And then I realize I can't live like that. You know, yeah. I can only do the best that I can and let them know, hey, sorry if that in any way took away from your experience of the pay-per-view or any show that I made a mistake on the announcement. Yeah. Um, so I feel bad for that. And then, hey, I'm doing my best. Like it's, Oh, I didn't mean to do it. Like I'm not purposely, you know, yeah, doing these things or anything like that. But that's why I do. Um, it, they mean a lot. The yeah. fans mean a lot, and the impact that I made, and somebody like that to get tattooed. But like I said, that's the most drastic that I've seen. You know, I've had like where I've signed a guy's arm, and he actually tattooed my signature. And, like any of those things, I'm like wow, wow, that's pretty amazing. You know. But even just the fans that I meet, they're like, oh my God, you know, in tears. And this girl gave me this bracelet that she made me and I still have it. And she was just in tears meeting me like, wow, I, it's crazy to know that I can make that much impact where somebody's, you know, bringing them to tears and all. But it's a, it's a beautiful thing at the same time. Yeah. So finally, you're going to finish off with a two pronged question. Yes. One, um, what's been your favorite memory? from working in WWE at a live show or um, or anything like that. And two, uh, what's next for Lillian Garcia? The angel Lillian Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, I have to say, after, uh, after all these years and everything that I've gone through and the WrestleManias that I've sang at or that I've announced in the matches and all of that, I don't think there was any moment that is that has been bigger than after 9-11. Yeah. And it's okay. something that has it's just been embedded in my brain and it was more than just, it, it's one of those things you can't even explain. I mean, it became, we were the first ones to actually go live and do a show. Everyone else canceled. It was the first big show, wasn't it, yeah. after the, yeah. yeah. It was the only one that's gone live. Everything else got canceled over the weekend. And yeah. I'll never forget that Vince went out there and said, this is exactly what they want. They want us to cancel, they want us to disrupt our life, they want all of that, no, we're gonna stand strong and we're gonna move forward. And I was like, wow. And listening to his speech, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then I'm like, oh my God, I gotta go after this and, you know, and sing. But like I said, when I look to my left and I see all the superstars lined up on the ramp and everybody's, you know, hand of their heart and the tears and then the fans and, Wow, and the USA chants afterwards, and it was a moment, and how can you even top that? It was incredible, because it was more than just wrestling. It was really about our country coming yeah. together and people coming together in a, in a painful feeling, you know, what they were feeling, and then that moment happened. So It's that, just a moment that kind of becomes part of you, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that whole yeah. show was just incredible. The whole yeah. entire tribute show was just amazing. So that and sinking some beers with Steve Austin. I oh, imagine. now that, I, mean, I got to tell you. <laughs> Jake, that was so funny. And now it's fun that they've actually released the DVD of the After Raw. Of course, yeah. Well, because then people the got to see, you know, what happened because Stone Cold would always bring me up there and <laughs> checking the beers and doing the proposal. And, oh, it was just great. It was fun. I, I love working with him. and. Oh, it's funny doing the, I just did the podcast with him not long ago. Yeah, and it was awesome. Yeah, it's great to, you know, get back together. Um, and he's just an awesome guy. So you live quite close to him? Yeah, he's in that yeah we both live well. in Marina Del Rey. Oh, lovely. So it's pretty wild. I actually ran into him. I was walking out of a restaurant. He was walking into the restaurant. We looked at each other and we're like, what are you doing? What are you doing here? I was like, I live here. What? I live here too. Oh, no. It was great. Uh, and so finally, what is next for Lillian Garcia? Yeah. Well, you know, I hope to be here a lot longer. Um, it's been a, an amazing journey that I'm not ready for it to end, you know, and what's great is that I've been able to incorporate this and singing and singing has just been a big part of me and I've got a whole new group that I've put together and we're going to be playing out and um, I did a residency in Vegas with wow. my band and that was a lot of fun and so like I said, it's just music, incorporating music and then, and then keep this train going with announcing and just having an amazing time here of all the things that I get to, to do in this life. Well, the fans love you here, so long may it last. I love them back. Awesome. <laughs> Lillian, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, guys.